I rent a room in my landlord's house. One night, about a year and a half ago, I was getting ready for bed. I turned off the light and I was just starting to drift off when I heard someone whisper in my ear, They're coming in the same house. Then I heard the toys that were left behind by my landlord's granddaughter go off at 3 a.m. The granddaughter, who was three years old at the time, used to talk to the wall, having full-on one-sided conversations with someone that none of us could see. And she'd act like they were answering her back. If you ever asked her who she was talking to, she'd just look back at the wall, then look at you, but not say anything. I really believe that there are just some people who are more in tune with the other side, and it wouldn't surprise me a bit if spirits go around asking everybody that they can find, can you hear me? I've also had similar experiences with hearing conversations. Sometimes it would sound like a dinner party was going on. I'd hear the sound of cutlery on dishes and the clanking of glasses. I told a few friends and family members about it, but they never believed me. The most memorable of these experiences happened when I was a teenager. My two cousins were spending the night, and we were camped out in the living room next to the TV. It was one of those big old boxy TVs that sat on the floor and was the size of a piece of furniture. In the middle of the night, I woke up because I could hear that there was a conversation going on between those same disembodied voices I always heard. I shook my older cousin to wake her up, and she was annoyed with me. I put my finger to my lips to shush her, and I quietly told her to just listen. She got very quiet and listened. Then she looked at me with fear in her eyes and said, Who is that? And I told her, those are the voices I've been telling you about, and you didn't believe me. At that point, although I was really scared, I was also elated because finally somebody else was hearing what I heard. She went to wake up my younger cousin, but I don't think my younger cousin really knew what was going on. We couldn't really tell what the people were saying, but after about a minute, one of the voices said, Shh listening to us. Then another voice laughed and said, <laughs> they're scared. That made my heart drop to my stomach and I remember a feeling of total dread because even though I'd heard them before, they had never acknowledged me until now. At that point, the voices stopped and the TV came on all by itself we were all three screaming, and my older cousin kept hitting the power button, desperate to turn the TV off, but it stayed on. Finally, she just yanked the power cord from the wall, but the TV still would not shut off. It stayed on for a couple more minutes, while we stared at it and each other in disbelief. Eventually, it went out, and the voices were gone too. I know this sounds like something straight out of a movie, but this was real. And as someone who has had these kind of experiences, I often wonder just how do the movies get it so right sometimes. I did not believe in ghosts before this happened. In fact, I made endless fun of people who did. It all began four years ago when I started teaching at an alternative school about 40 minutes from where I live. It's pretty much in the middle of nowhere and housed inside of a larger, mostly abandoned building. We only occupied about five rooms and the rest of the building went unused. And it's located right next to a very old cemetery. When I first arrived at the school, the principal would make jokes about the ghosts that lived there, but it was mostly along the lines of, Ooh, don't misbehave, or the ghost is gonna get ya. I thought it was a joke, so I just dismissed it. 
until one night that I stayed late to paint the classroom door. It was in November and the sun went down early. I was there at 6.30 p.m. and the building was mostly dark and I thought I was there alone. I was just happily painting away, completely unafraid. But for about 30 minutes I'd been hearing a rather rhythmic banging sound and it seemed to be coming from the lockers in the hallway outside my classroom. But I didn't think much of it. I thought maybe it was a rat or something. Then, for reasons I still cannot explain, I thought about the ghost. I suddenly realized that that banging was way too regular for it to be a rat, so I stepped into the hallway. Hello? I called out, sure that somebody was there. As soon as I said it, though, the noise went from a rhythmic banging to an all-out loud and fast banging for like 30 seconds straight. Freaked me out. But I was sure that there was a rational explanation for it. So I stood there in the quiet of the hallway, listening, trying to hear it again, to prove that it was just a coincidence and not a response to my hello. I stood there for a good five minutes and heard nothing. So I called out again. Is someone there? And again, as soon as I finished saying that, there came the same loud, hard banging. It was clearly the sound of somebody banging on the lockers, but I saw no one. I was still sure that there had to be some reasonable explanation, so I stood and waited again, continuing to hear nothing. Now at this point I should have just left, but I'm dumb, so I doubled down on the stupid. With my heart pounding, I said, Are you a ghost? Again it responded by banging loudly on the lockers. I was terrified, but I saw the opportunity of a lifetime. My whole life I feared death, but here was my one chance to prove that there is in fact life after death. I figured it was the only chance I'd get, so I said, Are you a friendly ghost? Dead silence. But I continued. I asked, Do you want to hurt me? And at that moment, I got the craziest, loudest pounding response yet. I screamed, dropped my paint on the floor, and took off running down the hallway towards the exit. And while doing so, I inadvertently left my wallet, cell phone, and car keys behind. Honestly, I'm not sure what my plan even was, I was just blindly running trying to get away, and as I ran, the loud banging noise followed me down the hallway, banging on the lockers close behind me. As I made a mad dash for the front door, I noticed that the main office had lights on, and my principal and another teacher were in there talking. I burst through that office door, scared out of my mind, and I nearly gave them both a heart attack. The principal asked me what was wrong. I said, there's a ghost in here. And he said, Uh, yeah, I told you about that when you first started here. And I said, But I thought you were joking. After calming down and telling him what happened, he walked me back to my classroom to get my stuff. After walking me to the car in the parking lot, the principal got in his own car and drove away. But the moment he left, the banging started again. This time, though, on the AC unit that was located outside the building near my car. I've never driven out of a parking lot so fast in my life. Over the years in that place, I've heard disembodied voices of young children laughing, had heavy boxes fly off shelves, had teachers hear their names called when no one was around, and seen chairs move across the floors by themselves, and plenty of other things. There was even a female ghost seen wearing old-timey clothes standing out by the dumpsters. I'll never make fun of people who believe in ghosts ever again. This took place in 2014 in a small town in New Jersey. Before this happened, I didn't believe in ghosts. It was New Year's Eve and I was at my friend Jay's house. He always told me that his house was haunted and that all the activity happened in the attic. 
we decided to go up there and do a voice recording. I couldn't believe my ears when we actually caught a voice on the tape. But much to my disappointment, I accidentally deleted it off my phone. We told our mutual friend John about it, and he wanted to experience it for himself. So, another day, we all went up there together. Here's the layout of the attic. When you get to the top of the stairs, on either side there's a little alcove. Then, straight ahead, there's a window, and at the back of the attic, there's a small room that was used as the maid's chambers in the 1800s. Other than that, it's just a regular attic. It was pretty messy with things scattered all over the place. Holiday decorations, old toys, furniture, things like that. We went up there and set our cell phones to record. I put mine in the main part of the attic and John put his in the maid's room. We started asking basic questions like, Hello? Is anyone there? How old are you? And did you live here? After about 15 minutes, we called it quits. I shut off my recorder, and as John went to get his from the maid's chambers, I heard the sound of chimes. I asked Jay if he had a clock in the attic, and he said no, so I just wrote it off to my imagination. Later, when we played the recording downstairs, on the recording, after John said hello, we heard a clear, loud, shh. And then, when he asked, is anyone here, we all heard a voice say, yes. Well, we were all pretty scared, but at the same time, we wanted more. It was like a drug hearing that voice. The following week, I was talking to a girl I had a major crush on, Debbie. She didn't believe in the supernatural at all. We showed her the recording and she insisted that it was BS. Then she demanded to go into the attic to see for herself. Jay and John came up with us, but even before we turned on the recorder, Jay said he wanted to go back downstairs. He said he just didn't feel safe up there. Debbie insisted that the lights be turned off before we started recording. She said it would be creepier that way. She didn't even believe in this stuff, so we kind of thought it was a dumb request. But I had a crush on her, so her wish was my command. The lights went off, and she stood next to me near the back of the attic and started asking questions. She was being pretty sarcastic. Then she asked me, Does Jay have a clock up here? I heard some chimes. I was taken aback for a second and told her that I also heard chimes the last time we did this, and that no, he didn't have a clock up here. Then John called out from the maid's room asking, Did you hear that? I was about to answer him, but before I could, we all heard what sounded like a child whimpering. Debbie freaked out and she said she wanted to get out of there. So we all went down to Jay's room to listen to the recording, to see if we picked up the child's voice. But there was nothing on the recording. Well, this upset Debbie because she knew she heard that voice. So again, she wanted to go up to the attic and find out what was going on. We all went back up there, but we didn't hear anything else in the house that night. The next morning, I woke up to five missed calls from Jay. I called him back immediately and he answered, which wasn't like him at all. It was 8 o'clock in the morning and Jay never woke up before noon. He told me I had to come to his house right away. Now, Jay has been terrified of that attic for as long as I can remember. He told me that a spirit pushed him down the stairs once when he was a kid, so he'll only go up there if someone's with him. When I arrived at his house, he told me that around 3 a.m. after we left, he kept hearing noises, as if things were being moved around up there. He wanted to go up and check, but he didn't want to go alone, so he asked me to go up with him. As I got to the top of the stairs, I started laughing, because everything in the attic was clean and perfectly set up. I thought he was having me on, and I said, Dude, I thought you didn't like it up here alone, so why did you come and clean it up? But when I looked into his eyes, I could tell he hadn't done it. 
he looked around the attic and said, This wasn't me. I asked him if I could do another recording, and he said that would be fine. I put my phone down, and I asked whatever was living in the attic to throw something or hit me, do something to prove that it was the one that moved the things around. But nothing happened. I kept trying to provoke a response by moving things and walking around the attic, asking questions. Yet we heard nothing. But later, when we listened to the recording downstairs, there was a sound of an old man saying, Get up. And a bit later on the tape, as I was walking around continuing to try to provoke, we heard a little girl say, Why are they doing that? When Jay and I heard that, We were pretty scared. This was a different child's voice from the one we heard the first time. We didn't know what was going on, but we really felt like we needed some answers. So I called John and told him to come by Jay's later that night, and we all went up there and did another recording again. We asked our regular questions, then went downstairs to listen. We heard the chimes again, but no voices this time. The next day... I sent the recording to my friend Pat. After listening to it, he told me to never go up in that attic again. He said the chimes were notes of the devil's triad, music that shows that you're a Satan worshiper. This piqued my interest. After the call from Pat, I went to see Jay. When I got to his house, he was on the porch smoking a cigarette, and he was holding something in his hand. I asked him what it was, and he handed it to me. It was a Bible. Jay had been renovating the basement, and he found it behind a wall. Inside it read, Presented to Rosanna Edwards on April 9, 1862. He told me to turn to a certain page. I have forgotten which page number, but on that page was a dark handprint. He said, It looks like dried blood to me. Now there's no way for me to verify that, so I still don't know to this day what it was. But I told him what Pat said about the devil worshipping, and he was scared. I told him that I would go to the county clerk and try to find out a little bit about the house's history. Before I left, though, I asked Jay to put the Bible in the attic to see if we could stir up some activity. Then I called Debbie and we went to the clerk's office together. But as far as telling us anything about why it was haunted, we really didn't find anything. We went back to Jay's that night and met John there. Jay said the house felt heavy all day, and we knew exactly what he meant. The energy of the air shifted as soon as we walked into the house. We were all scared, and none of us really wanted to go up into the attic again. Although we could hear a lot of movement up there, and we were curious, we were all too scared to go look. I do regret that, as I'm sure we would have captured something really good. We left the Bible up in the attic at Jay's request, and all went home. But when I got home, I told my little brother about all the activity, and he didn't believe me. So I took him over to Jay's house, and he heard the noises for himself and then refused to go up to the attic after hearing them. When we were leaving, as we stepped outside, my brother and I both heard a baby cry. Now it was past midnight in the middle of winter, and my brother and I looked at each other, confused. We looked back at Jay and said, What was that? He looked at us just as confused and said, What was what? And my brother and I said, That baby crying. It started getting louder, and Jay just said, Uh, what baby? It kept getting louder and louder, until it got so loud, I had to cover my ears. I said, You don't hear that? Jay just said, I have no idea what you're talking about. And that is when it all stopped. At that moment, Jay looked past me with a look of horror on his face, and he said, Dude, your car, look at your car. I turned around and I saw a small child's handprints all over my car. I was afraid to get in after that, but I did. 
the entire ride home, my anxiety was through the roof. I kept thinking that if I looked in the rearview mirror, somebody would be sitting in the back seat. But no one was there. When I got home, I texted Debbie and told her what was happening, and she told me that her cat hissed at her when she got home. She said her cat had never done anything like that before, but when she walked into the house, it looked at her and kept hissing. As I was trying to calm her down, the bookshelf in my room came tumbling down, and a small metal box went flying across the room, hit the wall, and broke in half. A metal box broke in half just from hitting the wall. Then Jay texted me to tell me that his house was literally shaking. He said it felt like an earthquake in there. After our three separate experiences, Jay agreed to take the Bible out of the attic. And as soon as he did, the activity stopped. When I tell people this story, I always say I wish it had a better ending. But something happened last year that tells me this may not be over yet. Three years ago, I moved to Florida. I found a job in a shop, and one day the staff were telling their own personal ghost stories. I never brought mine up, though, because when I tell people the story, I feel like they think I'm crazy. Although it all actually happened, I realize that it's sometimes hard to believe, so I don't normally tell people this story unless I know them pretty well. Anyway, they were telling their stories and one person pointed to me and said, Now that guy has a story. And I thought he was pointing to someone else, so I looked behind me. He laughed and said, No, I mean you. I said, How do you know that I have a ghost story to tell? And he said, That shadow spirit told me. You have something attached to you, you know. He then proceeded to tell me the story of Jay's house without me ever having spoken to this guy about the story before. I felt like crying. Ever since then, I've become even more interested in the paranormal. When I was five and my sister seven, my parents got a divorce and my mom took us to stay with my grandparents. The first night we slept there, I watched as the bedroom door creaked open and a tall black figure floated in. It stopped at the foot of my bed, turned to look at me, and I noticed that it had red glowing eyes. I literally fainted from fear and I woke up the next morning too afraid to say anything to my family. Random things like this continued to happen while we stayed there, like glowing eyes passing outside my door at night. When we were finally able to afford our own place and move out, I remember my sister and I packing and playing on top of the packing boxes. Then, suddenly, her face went pale and she stopped laughing and refused to talk to me. It would be many years before I found out the reason why. We were seven and ten when we moved, and we went to a big house. My sister and I had separate rooms upstairs, but the weird stuff began happening shortly after moving there, too. We could hear something hitting the radiator in the hallway all night, and we'd come home from school to find our toys lined up facing the door, as if they were waiting for us to walk in and nobody was home. It was all very unsettling. One morning, I woke up and it felt like my arm was burning. I looked at my arm and I found needles sticking out of it. I looked around to see what could have caused this, only to see all of my toys lined up on the floor facing me. I ran to get my mom and she helped me remove the needles. And while doing so, she told me that she had experiences as well. She told me her room was always cold enough to see her breath, even in the summertime. She went on to mention the stain in the hallway. Since moving in, I remember there was always a six-foot-tall stain that looked like mold on the hallway wall. She would scrub it clean constantly, but it always came back. 
She even had maintenance come to check for leaks on the roof or water damage, but they found no such thing. There was no cause for that stain, and it was in the shape of a person. But it was only on the wallpaper. The wood behind the wallpaper was perfectly fine. No moldy stain at all. A few months went by, and I was taking a shower in the upstairs bathroom. I locked the door, but midway through my shower, I heard the doorknob rattling violently. I yelled that I'd be done shortly, but it didn't stop. So I reluctantly got out of the shower to open the door. When I opened it, I saw what looked like a human figure crouched in the hallway. Its face looked like it was sewn together using various color skin grafts. It had red eyes, and its sharp teeth hung out of its mouth, which opened slightly when it saw me. It was the same figure that I had seen at my grandmother's house. The first time I saw it, it was too dark to see much, but this time it was partially illuminated, so I saw the face. I slammed the door and screamed for my sister. She came running asking me if I was okay, and she walked me back to my room after I calmed down. Shortly before we moved out of that house, it just happened to be the week before Halloween. I came home just at dark and parked my bike along the fence by the driveway. Our backyard was all muddy and totally enclosed by a fence. I left my bike near my stepdad's truck and was about to head inside when I heard a metallic bang coming from the truck. It was too dark to see anything, but I walked towards the truck to see if maybe it was my stepdad playing a prank. As I stepped towards the truck, I felt breath on my face and I heard a male voice whisper, Come here, come here, I won't hurt you. I screamed and I ran up the stairs to the porch. I put my back to the door and turned to see where the voice came from. Instead, all I heard were footsteps quickly advancing towards me, and I felt the breath on my face again as it whispered a little louder this time, Come here, come here. I ran inside, slamming and locking the door behind me. I made so much noise that my sister came down from upstairs to see me panting and pale, standing in the living room. She asked if I was okay, and I told her what happened, so she called our mother. Mom got home a little later, searching the yard with a bat, looking for any signs of an intruder, but she found nothing. The next morning, the police were there, searching the yard and asking me questions. They told me that they only saw my footprints in the mud, no one else's. But they could tell where I started running just from where the marks were I left on the ground. We kept moving houses, thinking it would help. This time, we moved to a trailer about an hour away. But the weird thing started happening yet again. By this time, my sister and I were 16 and 18. We would see shadows run through the kitchen and duck down behind chairs. One time, my sister was on a Zoom call with a friend, and the friend told her, don't turn around. Well, my sister did anyway, just in time to see all of her clothes fall off their hangers at the same time. Her friend said that she saw the clothes swinging and told her not to turn around just before they fell. My sister moved out because of this, and my boyfriend moved in. But just before she left, we talked in the kitchen about all the weird stuff that had been happening to us. It was then that I told her for the first time about the red eyes that I saw at our grandparents' house, and she turned pale. She then told me what happened the day we moved out of our grandparents' house. It turns out, the day we were playing on the moving boxes, she looked over to the doorway and saw a black mass walk past. It had what looked like spikes coming out of its back and a red glow to its face. So she saw it too. I was dumbfounded. We never told each other this because we both thought that we were crazy. But we both saw the same thing. Only she first saw it in daylight. When my sister moved out, my boyfriend and I moved into her old room. 
My boyfriend told me that for the first time in his life, he suffered from sleep paralysis. He would see a skeleton-like woman holding him down and getting right up in his face, nose to nose. He managed to squeak out a, help me, but he wasn't able to wake me up in time. Odd things kept happening there. But when I got pregnant with my daughter, it slowed down some, but only until she was born. When she was about a year old, I put her down on the floor in the living room and went to the bathroom quick. When I got back, I saw that she was chewing on something. When I got it out of her mouth, I realized it was a hospital identity band. I had no idea where she got it. She was still sitting in the exact same place I left her, and I know it wasn't there when I walked away. I looked up the woman whose name was written on the band and found out that she lived in the trailer before us. She died of cancer in the trailer. I wonder if that was the woman that my boyfriend saw holding him down. One night, before we finally moved out of there, my boyfriend and I listened as footsteps went up and down our hallway in front of our room all night. It would walk to the door, scratch at it a few times, then walk back down the hallway and return to do the same thing again. It did this for two hours straight. We live in a new trailer now, and I have two kids. About a year after moving, I woke up one night in a cold sweat. I sat up and saw a dark figure at the foot of my bed, and another one next to me, and a third behind my boyfriend on his side of the bed. I froze, and I watched them for a minute, and then I heard my boyfriend say, still half asleep, tell them I don't like when they stand behind me. I thought, okay, I am done. I got my boyfriend fully awake and we ran to check the kids. I got all the sage in the house, opened up all the windows and filled that house with sage smoke until I felt safe again. My kids are now eight and six, but since they were very little, they would both wake up crying, telling me that a man with red eyes touches them while they sleep. So he's still around, and he's after my kids now. When I was five years old, my parents and I lived with my grandfather in Iowa. It was a pretty big house, a manor actually. It had been in the family for a long time and was located on the outskirts of town near a forest. One day I was walking around the house just following my mom when I heard laughter coming from the basement. My mom had forbidden me from going down there alone, allegedly because it was so big and filled with piles of junk. So I waited for my mom to leave the room and I sneaked down there. I looked around for the source of the laughter and I saw a little girl. She was black, around seven years old, and dressed in really dirty, old-looking clothes. Not just old as in tattered, but old as in from another era. The moment we locked eyes, she ran off, scared. I searched for her, but I couldn't find her. As I was about to leave, a ball came rolling out of the darkness towards me. Well, that freaked me out, and I ran back upstairs. But a couple of days later, I went down again, and I took some toys with me. In my five-year-old mind, I thought, if there's a little girl in my basement, she must be bored and lonely, so I wanted to share my toys. I put them on the floor where I had last seen her, and when I went back a few days later, the toys had been moved. I called out, Hello? I'm glad you like the toys. You can come out. I won't hurt you. About 30 seconds later, she walked out from behind a mountain of furniture and boxes. I asked her her name, but she said she didn't have one. I then asked her why she was in the basement and didn't come upstairs. She said her parents didn't want her to because they were afraid of the people who lived upstairs. I told her that I lived upstairs too, and the only person up there that was scary was my mom, and she wasn't even that bad. I asked if I could meet her parents. 
She said they were a little afraid of people, but to wait a minute and she'd go ask. She was gone for quite a while and I got tired of waiting, so I went to look for her. I walked further into the basement and I saw what looked like holding cells. There was a black lady chained to the ground and a black man who was missing an eye and a good portion of his face. The woman's legs were crushed. In fact, she looked crushed from the waist down and the man looked like someone took a knife and went to town on his face and eye. I was really scared and started crying for my mom. She came flying down the stairs, grabbed me and asked me what was wrong. But I was crying so hard I couldn't say anything. She took me upstairs and after I calmed down, I asked her why there were people chained up in the basement. Mom got really mad at me and she denied that there was anything at all in the basement other than a bunch of junk and a washer dryer. But from that day forward, she locked that door and kept the key with her always. I think my mom had psychic abilities and knew full well what was in the basement. But mom was very close-minded about anything outside of the norm, so she kept denying it to herself and others. My dad was always checked out with drugs and alcohol, so he didn't have much to say on the subject. My grandfather, however, laughed and said, I see him at the people in the basement. He told me that he used to see them as a kid too, and he used to play with the little girl. He told me the ghost family used to work at the house. That was how I found out that my great-grandfather was a slave owner. Slavery was legal in Iowa until 1860, and from what I heard, my great-grandfather was not very nice to his slaves. He didn't see them as people, but as tools to be used for whatever purposes he chose. He was married with two daughters, but he would regularly force himself on the female slaves and beat them and the male slaves and children for any reason at all. If he were having a bad day, he'd take it out on them, and sometimes he'd even kill them. I was told a story about one female slave that became pregnant by him, and to hide that fact, he killed her and the unborn child. I was never allowed to go back in the basement again, but sometimes at night, I'd hear crying coming up through the vents, and I'd try to talk to whoever it was, but they never replied. I don't think they even knew that they were dead. That house is no longer standing. The land was sold to a developer, and a Walmart now stands where it used to be. I often wonder what happened to the spirits that lived in the basement, and I do hope that they eventually found peace. I was in the Navy as an avionics technician. Back in 2011, I was stationed in Afghanistan. Our patrol base was built along a wide canal, and there was a village just a few hundred meters away. One day my squad and I had to take a census of the village and gather whatever information we could about the locals there. There weren't many people, just a small marketplace and about five or six families. There were also a lot of empty buildings. All of the families were quite young, too. Some didn't have any children yet, which for Afghanistan is pretty weird. There was one guy that stood out above the rest, an old man named Bashar. He was the only person in his village older than 30. We started talking to him and he told us the story of his village and of another census that was taken there years ago. And what a story it was. Back during the Soviet-Afghan War, he lived there with his wife and three children. There were also many other families there at that time as well, and they all belonged to the same tribe. Bashar had been lucky enough to attend school in a nearby town, and he spoke English, Russian, Farsi, and a few other languages. This would ultimately be his saving grace. One day, a group of Soviet soldiers showed up and asked who in the village could speak Russian. Bashar was the only one who could, so he stepped forward. After they confirmed that he could indeed both speak and read in their language, the Soviets swept through the entire village and killed every single person there except him. 
Men, women, children, the elderly, every last person was slaughtered, with the exception of Bashar. They even killed his wife and children while he watched. They then forced him to go through the entire village and identify every one of the bodies. They had him write down their names and turn the master list over to the Soviet platoon commander. That's how they did their census. Once they had the list of names, they left and never returned to the village ever again. So there was no reason for them to do what they had done aside from hatred and spite. After that, Bashar became a soldier himself, intent on avenging the lives of his people. But before he could set out to exact his revenge, Bashar had to bury every single body that the Soviets had slaughtered. According to Islamic custom, bodies are supposed to be buried within 24 hours of their death. But some of those people were denied even that basic dignity. He never said how long it took him, but eventually he was able to bury them all. Now, I didn't know about any of this until after what I'm about to tell you. The bodies were buried right next to our base, and there were a lot of them. Fast forward to 2011. I was outside on night duty by myself at the base, when out of nowhere I started hearing immense amounts of gunfire coming from the direction of the village. At first I thought there was a wedding going on. If you've ever been to an Afghan wedding, then you'll know what I mean. It was far too late for it to be the Taliban, since they don't like to be out at night and definitely don't want to be that close to a military base. So I radioed over to the other post to see if they knew what was going on. But they had no clue what I was even talking about. The Marine on duty was a guy I knew very well, and he was a very serious man. He wouldn't be joking around with me. The guy completely denied hearing any gunfire or seeing anything. He had absolutely no idea what I was hearing because no one else was hearing it but me. Then the screaming started. I'll never forget that sound as long as I live. It was a wailing like I'd never heard before. And it wasn't just one person. It sounded like there were dozens and dozens of people screaming. Agonizing, blood-curdling yells were punctuated by a crescendo of gunfire. This went on for several long minutes. And then, the gunfire died down, and I could hear moaning, and what clearly sounded like children, crying. After that, it was dead silent. No noise was heard for the next two hours until my relief came. I left my post bewildered, and I tried to pass it off as delusions caused by lack of sleep. The next morning I woke up and I went to find the Marine who had relieved me. I asked him how it went the night before, and he replied that he didn't want to talk about it. I pried a little more because his reply piqued my interest. He then proceeded to relate to me the exact same thing that happened to me. Everything was the same. He was visibly shaken when I told him that I had heard those things too. We started asking around, and we found that no fewer than four other Marines had experienced the exact same thing, but only on night watch and only at that particular post. I never believed in the paranormal, but that day, I gave it more credence than I ever did before. I still can't explain what happened or why. I only know what I heard and that I wasn't the only one it happened to. Everyone who ever stood watch at that post swore that the place was haunted. It was certainly one of my strangest and, frankly, the most unsettling thing that's ever happened to me. And I imagine it'll remain that way for quite some time to come. My name is Brett, and I grew up in Akron, Ohio, and currently live in Georgia. As a kid, our homes were plagued with terror. My older brother, Joe, and I saw and heard things which lead me to believe that true evil does exist. A child is truly innocent, and if there are forces out there that malevolent in the world that they'd terrorize children, surely they must be the embodiment of evil. In 1985, we lived in a house that frightens me to this very day. 
Things that took place within those walls terrorized our family the entire time we lived there. One such event we called the Black Cassandra, because as kids we didn't know to call it a shadow figure. My mother's name was Cassandra, and it had her basic shape, so we named it after her. My older brother Joe Jr. was seven at the time, and I was five. One night, my mom was babysitting our cousins, and they were sharing the bedroom with Joe and me. After a long day of playing, we had dinner and were put to bed. During the night, Joe woke up and nudged me, asking if I was awake. I said yes. We could hear Madonna music being played downstairs, our mother's favorite. She always played music when she cleaned the house, which she often did late at night when my father was out. Our cousins were asleep on the other side of the room, so Joe whispered, Let's go downstairs and be with Mom. I agreed, so we slowly got up and made our way to the bedroom door, careful not to wake up the others. Ever afraid of the dark, we held hands as we made our way to the bedroom door. We opened it and noticed that someone was across the hall in my mom's room, sitting on the floor. The hair on the back of my neck stood up, and a sensation of fear that's hard to articulate came over me as we stared into the room across the hall. What must have been only a few seconds seemed to stretch into infinity as our eyes tried to focus in the dark and our brains tried to understand what we were seeing. All the lights were off upstairs, so the only light we had was a dim stream coming from the stairway at the end of the hall. Mom's room was pitch black, but something was sitting right there, right in front of us, and it was so black it stood out from the surrounding darkness. It was sitting Indian style on the floor, and it had the basic silhouette of our mom. Its head was looking down, but then it suddenly looked up, right at us. Fear hit us like a lightning bolt, and my older brother let go of my hand and took off without me. Needless to say, I was right behind him, and we flew down the stairs to our mom. As we reached the landing, screaming and crying, our mom came over, angry that we were making so much noise. She said, What the heck are y'all doing making that noise? You're gonna get it. Now that there was spanking talk. We continued to cry, and she sat us on the sofa and told us to calm down. We tried to tell her what happened. As we started to explain, her eyes widened, and she hugged us close and told us everything would be okay. Mom said a few prayers with us, and then she brought out some paper and pencils, and she told us to draw what we saw in her room. I told her that the pencil wasn't dark enough to draw the thing that we saw. We were terrified, but she thought of a plan to calm us down. Mom used her secret weapon. She gave us each some licorice. We gobbled down the candy, and for a moment, we forgot about the menace waiting for us upstairs. After 20 minutes, Mom had enough. It was well past midnight, and we needed to go to bed. Okay. It's time to go back upstairs, Mom said. Our eyes got wide and the tears came down again as we realized she wanted us to go back upstairs alone. Mom, please come with us, Joe begged. I just kept on crying. Mom started to raise her voice and began her well-known, well-respected count to three. For the uninitiated, that means if she got to three and we hadn't done as she asked, the belt would start swinging and butts would start hurting. One, Mom said as she went around the corner to grab the belt. We moved a little closer to the bottom of the stairs. Two, she said as she rounded the corner of the dining room, belt in hand. Three, and she came towards us with the belt held up. In defeat, we started our journey back upstairs under extreme duress. Joe took my hand, and we slowly crept up the stairs, still aware of what awaited us around the corner. Being in front, Joe had a better vantage point, and he could see what was there. And once he saw it, he let go of my hand and once again abandoned me and started running. Joe was a pathetic older brother. I still tease him about it to this day. I panicked and scampered after him, I saw Joe's back as he leapt into the darkness of our room. But as I entered the room, 
the door slammed on me, hitting me in the face, knocking my head against the corner of the door jamb. I screamed in pain and lay on the floor in terror. Our cousins woke up when they heard the noise, and Mom ran upstairs to comfort me. That house terrorized us for the entire time we lived there, and I'm happy to say we're now out of its grip. Whenever I go home, I take my wife and children to look at the old house, and I've even knocked on the door to see if the entity is still there. But no one answers the door, so I still don't know. Between the ages of 9 and 14, I lived in a haunted home with my brother and father. My dad gained custody of my brother and I when I was 7 and my brother 4. For a while we lived in a small two-bedroom home. I hated having to share a room with my brother, so when my dad told me that our landlord had bought a much bigger three-bedroom home down the road and was willing to rent to us, I was thrilled. Dad worked as a prison guard, so he wasn't home during the hours of 6 a.m. to 5 p.m. We had a babysitter until I was around 12. After that, though, we were on our own. We got ready for school and fed ourselves. This wasn't a problem, because I knew how to cook and keep house, so we mostly had a very good relationship with our dad. I will note, though, that he was an annoyingly skeptical man at this point in his life. I remember when we first toured the house. I barely paid attention to most of it, just fought with my brother over who got the bigger room. I had absolutely no reason to be upset, but then, out of the blue, I suddenly felt that there was something off about the place. I told my dad the house didn't feel right to me. He told me it was probably because it was hot in the house, and I accepted that because I didn't want to think about it anymore. I wanted to be excited about the new house. We moved in about a week or so after that, and for a while everything was fine. My room felt welcoming and cozy. Nothing bad happened for a couple of months. At most, I saw some movement out of the corner of my eye, but such things were very easy to dismiss. The one thing that really bothered me, though, was the basement. It was like a concrete cave. It had low ceilings and a deep, dark storage room where we kept all of our Christmas and Halloween decorations. The main area had our washer and dryer and a bunch of my dad's driftwood art projects. But that basement made me feel sick, like I had a deep pit of dread in my stomach that wouldn't go away until I got back upstairs. Of course, the laundry was my job, so I would make my trips down there as quick as possible and then get out of there. It all started with the voices. They were quiet at first, but eventually I would be startled awake by random screams that nobody else seemed to be able to hear. Heavy footsteps and banging outside my bedroom door were next, and that became common. My bedroom was at the center of the house, off the computer room. My dad's was on one side by the kitchen, and my brother's on the other by the living room, so we weren't exactly close to one another. Soon after all this started, however, my brother began sleeping in my dad's room with him, so something must have been bothering him, too. The activity was constant for a while, with things getting knocked over, noises at night, and a general eerie feeling. It began escalating one night when I had my friends over. My dad was at a neighbor's house playing poker, and my friends and I were listening to music. Suddenly, one of my friends said, Wait, who's that? We all turned to look where she was pointing, at the TV set. All of us were sitting around a table and we could see a reflection in the large TV screen. But there was somebody else being reflected there, besides us. The image of a man sitting on the couch behind us. We were stunned. We kept looking back and forth from the empty couch to the TV screen. My friend stood up and then... We all watched in horror as the mystery figure on the screen slowly turned to look at her. We screamed and ran outside. I ran down the street to get my dad to come home, but when he did, he insisted that we had just scared ourselves, nothing more. As time went on, things in the house got worse. I developed insomnia, and I started getting paranoid. 
I became depressed and refused to get out of bed some days. I started feeling weak and like I just wasn't fully present with the others. As my mental state went downhill, this opened a door for the spirits and they moved in closer to me and I began to see them. At times, a tall shadow man would creak open my door at night and stare at me and I would hear what sounded like a woman softly crying underneath my bed. There was also a man with a burnt face who used to hide in dark corners in the basement. I could hear his raspy breathing long before I saw him. It felt like I was living in a nightmarish version of a Dr. Seuss book, and my father refused to acknowledge any of it. One day, I was walking through the computer room, and I felt like I ran into somebody's open hand. The fingers wrapped around my neck and began to squeeze. I stumbled backwards and just stood there, holding my neck in shock. Later, I began to cough up small amounts of blood. This concerned my father, and he took me to the ER. The doctor shined a light down my throat, and he said I had several tiny lacerations in the back of my esophagus. He asked me if I had accidentally eaten some metal or glass. I was sure I hadn't. And a couple of months after that, I woke up spitting up blood again and the same lacerations were found in my esophagus. This even happened to a friend of mine when she spent the night. To this day, I still can't find a rational explanation to explain these injuries. I feel my breaking point with this house came when I went to retrieve the laundry from the basement one day. I was almost up the stairs when I felt a cold hand wrap around my ankle, and then I was violently yanked screaming down the concrete stairs. This ripped a huge patch of skin off the front of my leg and left my cheek and elbow bleeding. As I hit the basement floor, I heard raspy laughter, mocking and cruel. I ran upstairs sobbing, begging my dad to find another place and move, pleading with him to please believe me. But he simply insisted that I just lost my footing as he tended to my wounds. And that was the last he wanted to hear about it. Determined to prove to him that the house was haunted, I made a pair of dowsing rods. For anyone who doesn't know, dowsing rods are bent metal rods that you hold in your hands and they rotate when you come into contact with magnetic energy. They were once used to find water underground, but you can also use them to detect spirits. I made the rods out of wire coat hangers. My dad watched, amused, as I walked around the computer room with the rods in my hand. As I got closer to the shelf that held my father's precious moments figurines, the rods began to aggressively move towards me. Then, if I would step away, they'd move away from me. Does that mean they're full of water, my dad asked, mocking me? Just as he said that, it looked as if an invisible arm swept along the shelf and threw every single one of those figurines against the wall. Dad's face dropped. After that, the spirits started stalking my dad, too. They now knew he believed in them, so there was no point any longer in hiding. My dad told me that the shadow man would stand outside his room at night and watch him for hours. He couldn't sleep anymore, and he almost lost his job. We moved out soon after that. As the years went by, I saw many families move in then out of that house. No one stays there for long. I had the opportunity a few years ago to tour the place, as it was up for rent again. Walking from room to room, it was clear to me that the bad energy was still there, dark and heavy as ever. I asked the new landlord in the most gentle way if previous tenants had said anything about the activity. He was surprised by the question and told me that he didn't know as he had just recently bought the property. We ended up talking for a while, and I gave him the best heads up that I could. He seemed more intrigued than upset. I hope he keeps that enthusiasm. I did not rent the house, and have put it and its less than pleasant memories in the past. One thing I'm thankful for, though, is the endurance I developed while living there. I'm no longer afraid of ghosts. I've been yelled at, intimidated by, and hurt by them. I've seen them at their worst. So now, instead of cowering, I thrive in paranormal locations. I actually enjoy them. 
Many spirits just want to be acknowledged and understood, but some want to pull you down the stairs. Just like people, they can't all be winners. That house helped me to be brave and face my fears. It made my dad a believer, and it gave us all a lot of stories to tell. So I guess I'm grateful for the experience, even though ultimately it was a negative one. It helped mold me into the strange person that I am today. In front of my grandmother's house is a long meadow. It was a battlefield during the Civil War. So, yeah, super haunted. A third of the meadow has been turned into a baseball field, so the grass is super short. But the other two-thirds has wild hay growing, and it's long. There's something about that field. I always get the feeling that there's someone right behind me, watching me, and following me every step of the way. One day, my friend Lizzie, her four-year-old brother Jack, and my two-year-old sister Molly were at my grandma's house. It was about two in the afternoon and we all went out for a walk. Heading back home, we had just gotten to the edge of the baseball field and the little kids were tired. So we decided to carry them piggyback the rest of the way. Jack got on my back and my sister Molly got on Lizzie's back and we set off across the big field. We were walking along a path that goes straight down the middle of the open field. While walking, Jack and I were a lot further ahead, so we stopped to let the other two catch up to us. We were talking about birds or flowers, something like that, when all of a sudden, Jack tightened his grip on me. Now, I'm not talking that he was giving me a hug. I'm saying he had a vice-like grip around me, digging his fingers into my shoulders and pointing to a tree. Ghost, he whispered in my ear. What, buddy? I said, not fully understanding him. There's a yellow ghost and a black snake behind it. He whispered so quietly I could barely hear him. Just then, Molly and Lizzie caught up with us. Lizzie was still giving Molly a piggyback ride, and she saw the look on my face and asked what was wrong. And just as I was about to answer... Molly chimed in and said, Yellow ghost, and pointed to the same tree that Jack was pointing to. Well, we ran as fast as we could with the two kids on our backs, and when we got to the end of the field, we put the kids down so they could walk. But then, Jack pointed to another area and said, There's a purple woman standing there, but don't worry, she's nice. When we got back to the house, we went online and we looked up what the different colors meant when it comes to spirits. It said that yellow was a warning and purple was protection. Here's a bonus story also involving my grandmother's house. One day we had just gotten back from the Dairy Queen and we were getting out of the car in the driveway. I happened to look up and I saw a face staring at me from the upstairs window. I remember it was a really pale-looking guy. He looked sick, just colorless. He had big brown eyes, wore a gray hat, and had a very sad expression on his face. Grandma had already gone inside up to her room, the very room where I saw this man, so I ran inside to warn her. As I was climbing the stairs, she was already coming back down. In that short amount of time, the man was no longer there because my grandmother saw nothing when she went to her room. It turns out that the old house was used as a hospital during the Civil War. I can only imagine how many soldiers died there and in what pain they must have been. When my grandmother first bought the house, she had workers on the second floor doing renovations. One day, she was just getting home from the grocery store when she looked up and saw that same pale guy that I saw staring at her from the second floor window. She figured it was just one of the workers. But later, when they were leaving for the day, she asked them, is that everyone? They said yes. She then asked if they had a pale looking guy with brown eyes and a gray hat working with them. They said they didn't have anyone like that on their team, nor had they seen anyone like that there that day. I guess this guy is still hanging around, even today.
This is my dad's story. He was stationed at an Air Force base in Greenland. They often had blizzards there, and when they did, the base would be put on lockdown and they'd take roll call to make sure that everyone was accounted for. These blizzards were intense. They had to have cables running between all of the buildings, and you had to attach a carabiner to yourself and them so that if there was a sudden whiteout, you didn't get lost and die. They had people die literally 20 feet from shelter because they got lost in the blinding snow and froze to death. Dad said there was about a five-month period where every time they went on lockdown, they'd hear horrendous screaming outside. But after taking a head count, all personnel were accounted for, so they couldn't risk sending anybody out to investigate. It was just too dangerous in the snow. At first, they tried to write it off as an animal. However, every time the screaming was heard, the next day, they'd find the engine room torn up. Tools would be thrown everywhere, paperwork was all over the floor, and tables and toolboxes were knocked over. One time, even a 3,000-pound jet engine was lifted off its crane and smashed to the floor almost 30 feet away from where it was hanging. The hangars and engine room all had surveillance cameras covering every single entrance and spotlights. The lights made it possible for the cameras to see the doors even during whiteout conditions. But no animals, no people, no anything was ever seen entering or leaving those buildings. After one such incident, a U-2 plane in the shop had all of its electronics turned on. The systems on that plane were specifically built for that particular crew's mission. They were complex and archaic, and it wasn't a simple matter of hitting a power button or flipping switches from off to on. Very few people knew how to operate that machinery for it, and the only ones on the base who could were two engineers, and they were in lockdown and accounted for when it happened. Another time, three barrels of heavy hydraulic fluid vanished and were never seen again. Then one day, it all just stopped. But this was not something that the military just shrugged off. It cost a lot of money every time that place was trashed, and it threw a wrench into at least one surveillance mission that we know of. That caused the brass at the DOD and the CIA to breathe fire down the neck of the base commander. The facility, aside from its military function, also served as a base for a lot of civilian research as well. So they launched a full investigation into the matter, using scientists, engineers, and specialists of all kinds. But they were never able to come up with a satisfactory explanation for what was happening. While they didn't know what was causing it, they doubted that the screaming noise was the wind, because it came in short, irregular bursts. Also, while monitoring our systems, they picked up on a bunch of weird interference and had anomalous readings on the nights that it would happen. And they were never able to reproduce those errors in a controlled setting. This is the most terrifying thing that I've ever experienced. Back when I was eight or nine, my brother and I used to sleep over at my grandma's a lot. My brother hogged the back bedroom for himself, even though it was supposed to be for the both of us. I think he kicked me out because that was the bedroom that had the video games. So this left me to sleep on the couch in the living room. I was afraid of every single room in that house, and I refused to be there alone, especially if I were in the back of the house, where they didn't have many lights. So just imagine how well I fared in a dark living room at night, all alone. Spoiler alert, not well. Even though I wasn't supposed to, I would stay up every night watching TV, often into the early morning hours, just so I could have the light and the sound coming from the TV to calm my nerves. Now, Grandma's house had a resident ghost. She told me many times that it was very friendly but it sure scared the crap out of me a few times. One particular time, though, will stick with me forever. The night started off like any other. My brother locked himself in the back bedroom to play video games, and Grandma was tucked in bed, so that left me alone in the dark living room. 
I waited for Grandma to fall asleep before turning the TV on, and I kept the volume very low so I could barely hear it. I didn't want Grandma waking up and punishing me. Grandma's house was really old, and the doors were all made of particle board, and the back bedroom door was pretty much destroyed by my older cousin. So every time that door was opened, it made a really loud sound. The time passed rather quickly, and before I knew it, it was two in the morning. And that's when it happened. I remember feeling it and hearing it long before anything else. You know when you're alone and you suddenly get a chill up your spine and your brain tells you you're not alone anymore? Well, I felt that. And I heard a sound. For me, it sounded like a mixture of TV static and the ringing you get in your ears when the room is too quiet. It was soft at first, coming from the end of the hall. I turned the TV volume even lower, just in case my grandma had woken up and was coming out to scold me. Then I heard the sound of footsteps coming from the bathroom at the end of the hall. I remember trying to figure out who it was, grandma or my brother. But my heart was pounding and my fight-or-flight instincts were kicking in, though I calmed down a little bit, telling myself it was probably just my brother trying to scare me. Until I realized that if it was my brother, I would have heard that back bedroom door open, and I hadn't. Remember, that back bedroom door made a terrible sound every time it was opened, making it pretty hard to sneak up on me. That is when the panic officially set in, and whatever was making that noise began moving towards me. When the static ringing got louder, I felt a presence at the end of the hall. I couldn't move. I was so scared I just lay there waiting to see it. Sitting there in the dark, I saw a shadow man looming at the end of the couch. I covered up my head with the blankets. Then I suddenly remembered something my grandmother always told me to do if I saw a spirit. She said, Just tell them you're fine and that they can go home. They aren't there to hurt you. They just want to check up on you. So after chanting, I'm fine, go home. I'm fine, go home. From underneath the blankets, the ringing sound stopped and the presence left. I remember peeking out from under the blankets after about five minutes of silence and seeing just a dark hallway. I wasted no time in running right into my grandmother's room. But even after all that, I still slept on the couch in the living room alone. This wasn't my first nor was it my last paranormal experience, but it was certainly the one I'll remember for the rest of my life. It was really creepy, but I'm sure whoever it was really was just checking up on me. So I guess what I want to say here last is if you ever encounter one like me, a nice spirit, just tell it that you're fine and they can go home. It's probably checking up on you to see if you're okay, even if it is spooky as hell. I went on a vacation in the Midwest to an area that had a lot of metaphysical shops. I told my husband that I'd always wanted to see a psychic, so I made an appointment and went to one. She began by describing my children and their personalities as if she knew them personally. She knew their strengths and weaknesses, and she got everything right. So I asked her next to please contact my grandmother who had died eight years earlier. The psychic was sitting there with her eyes closed and began to laugh and make an odd face. She apologized and said that she was really trying to connect with my grandmother, but that something else kept getting into the way of her vision. Then she asked me, Do you have a lot of dogs on the other side? I don't mean one dog. I mean a lot of dogs. There's a bunch of them here, and there's more coming. And there's one, a special one. The light from this dog is so bright it's almost blinding. It's impossible not to pay attention to him. She continued speaking with her eyes still closed. This dog is your spirit guide, and he's still with you. He loves you and is protecting you from the other side. And there are just so many other dogs that keep appearing. I'm sorry, but I can't focus on anything else but them right now. 
but I am trying to get to your grandmother. She then opened her eyes and saw me sitting there with tears running down my face. I was crying so hard I couldn't breathe. I finally pulled myself together and told her, Yeah, there were a lot of dogs in my life. My passion has always been animal rescue, ever since I was a child. I fostered and saved literally hundreds of dogs from horrible situations. Just prior to my visit, I had lost three dogs that were very special to me. One of them I'd raised from an abandoned puppy and loved him his whole life till he died. And I think he was the spirit guide. When I told her this, she said, That makes a lot more sense now. I've never had a reading take a turn like this. But I'm here to tell you, you are protected by them and that you're definitely doing what you're meant to do in life. These dogs are your biggest fans, and they act as your guides, and they want you to know that they're still with you and always will be. I left the place, went back to my hotel, and I cried for an hour. That reading was the best part of my trip. My cat comes to visit me a lot. She died a few years ago, but while I'm lying in bed in the morning, I'll feel her jump up, walk around, then lie down on my hip. It's how she used to wake me up for school every day. I used to think I was just dreaming, but it's also happened when I'm awake, so I have no explanation for it. Her death wasn't a surprise as she was old. I'd had her since I was two, and she was the only one from her litter still alive. She always seemed way too smart for a cat and would show up just when you needed her, as if she sensed that you were in need of comfort. She also had a very weird ritual of building an altar out of rocks in the woods, and she'd leave a portion of her prey in the middle of it. It was a little ring of rocks placed in a circle, and I never saw her do it, but if we even moved a pebble of it, it would just get rebuilt in the same spot every time. When she'd kill something, she'd leave a little piece of it in the circle, almost like an offering. We found things like half a snake, half a frog, a mouse head, bird feathers, and what we think was the tail of a rabbit. It was creepy, according to my mom, but I always thought it was cool. I'm not entirely sure why she did this. I haven't been able to come up with a logical explanation for it. Nothing and no one else ever touched that circle except us and her and we only touched it to tear it down, but she'd rebuild. No other animals went near it, even though we were living in a rural part of Kentucky and there were plenty of other animals around. I had friends tell me that my cat creeped them out because she would look at them like she was a human. So that spawned theories that she was more than a cat. The theories included that she was a reincarnation of a human or a shapeshifter or what some people call a familiar a cat that consorts with witches. I don't know how or why she was the way she was, but she lived almost 10 years longer than any of her cat siblings, and she could unlock and open doors. Even when we switched door locks, she could still do it. Unlike me, my family are hyper-religious, and they were all horribly freaked out by it. But I loved her. This happened eight years ago. My husband and I were in bed one night watching TV. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw a child in the doorway of our bedroom. Thinking it was our only child at the time, two-year-old Connor, I whispered to my husband, Hey, I think Connor's going to try to scare us. We watched in silence, soon realizing that this was not our son. He walked in with his head slightly tilted back, curls bouncing as he walked and his diaper making that squishing sound that plastic makes when it rubs against your skin. He walked to the foot of our bed, then crouched down out of our line of sight. And when we got up to look, he was gone. I looked at my husband and said, Did we just see a ghost? Then, almost as an afterthought, I said, Well, now we know if we have another baby, he'll have curls, and he came to visit us before he was born. We both laughed because at that time we were not planning on having more children. But a few months later, 
surprise, I got pregnant. Fast forward a few years, and our new baby Liam was two. He walked into the room one night, head slightly tilted back, curls bouncing as he walked, and his diaper making that same squishy noise that plastic does when it rubs against your skin. It hit me like a bucket of ice water in my face. Holy crap, this is the baby that came to visit us three years ago. There is absolutely no doubt in my mind. On top of that, whenever Liam stays overnight somewhere else, like at my parents' house, he comes to visit me in my sleep, like in my dreams or astral projection. I'm not sure what it is. For example, one time he came to me and just smiled while I was taking a nap. He was wearing a little red shirt and his hair was short. But when he left home the day before to spend the night at my parents, he had long hair. The next day when I went to pick them up, Lo and behold, Liam's hair was freshly cut, and he was wearing that same little red shirt for my dreams. Mom had taken him for a haircut without telling me. So I asked her, was he wearing that same little red shirt yesterday? She said that yes, he had, but he insisted on wearing it again today. I walked over to him and asked, did you come to see Mama yesterday in her dreams? He looked up at me, his big blue eyes all serious, and he just nodded yes. He was four years old at the time. So that's my story, one of many. I guess our son is an astral traveler who even came to visit us before he was born. For me, utterly fascinating. I'm 28 years old and currently work for a marketing firm. I live alone in a small studio apartment that faces an old Islamic cemetery. During the COVID-19 lockdown, I visited that cemetery often, out of boredom, to feed the birds and just be outside. But since things have opened up again, I stopped going. But something seems to have taken offense to my staying away. Once I stopped going, I started hearing scratching sounds at night, like something scratching inside the walls with its nails. At first I thought it was my neighbor, but I spoke to him and he said he's been hearing it too, and he thought I was doing it. We're both spooked because we both live alone. Also, my things disappear, like headphones, stationery, books, and other small items. I always find them either under the bed or in the bathtub after a few days' time. And the doorbell always rings at night, every night. I went to our building's security office and asked them to check the footage to see who was ringing my doorbell every night, but no one was on camera. And last night, I was awoken to loud banging on my apartment door. There's a very small gap between the door and the floor, and if someone is standing outside, you can always see their shadow and I did see a shadow, but when I opened the door, there was no one there. I again called the building security to have them check the footage, and no one was seen banging on my door. They're beginning to think I'm imagining this because I make so many complaints. I've discussed this whole situation with my neighbor, who has since become a friend, and we're both thinking about getting help from the local church. Update. Since my last post, the activity and the strange occurrences have gotten worse. My neighbor left his apartment and moved to another city as he started to fear for his life. He told me he saw a dark figure that resembled a young boy in the corner of his apartment. It only appeared for a few minutes, then disappeared in front of him. Since he moved out, the scratching in the walls has grown louder and I can also hear scratching underneath my bed at night, too. It got so bad that I moved the mattress off the bed frame directly onto the floor so that nothing can be under my bed. I've been trying to ignore it as best I can. I borrowed a copy of the Koran from a colleague at work, and I keep it at home. He lent me a few Islamic paintings to hang on the wall as well, and he recorded himself reading some of the verses from the Koran 
and he told me to play them whenever I heard the noises, but nothing has helped. I've started going to sleep earlier, and I bought noise-canceling earphones to block out the scratching noises. I also disabled the doorbell so that it won't ring at midnight, and I keep the lights on all the time. Yet, one night as I was sleeping on the floor, I felt something touching my feet. I woke up to hear crying coming from the bathroom. I didn't move. I just sat there on the mattress, contemplating if this was a dream or not, when suddenly the bathroom door opened wide all on its own. I just shut my eyes. The crying continued for about 15 minutes, and by then I had realized that I was indeed awake. When the crying stopped, a very bad smell enveloped me. I didn't move at all. I didn't even make a sound. And then the same thing that was touching my feet was now touching my back. I started trembling out of fear, but I still kept my eyes closed and didn't make a sound. It continued touching my back for about a minute or two more, and then it moved away. I stayed in that same position for about 10 minutes more before I dared open my eyes. I went to check the front door and it was still locked from the inside, but the bathroom door was still wide open. I was so scared, I left my apartment and sat in the lobby until dawn. I was trying to gather enough courage to go back upstairs, but then I had another thought. I thought I would go to the cemetery and yell at whatever it was that was haunting me to leave me alone. So I did just that. I went to the same place in the cemetery where I used to sit, and I yelled as loud as I could. It felt nonsensical, but I literally yelled and cried and shouted to leave me in peace. Still angry, I came back to my apartment and did the same thing. I yelled loudly to leave me alone, and I told it that I was no longer afraid of it anymore. I then moved my mattress back from the floor onto the bed frame, and I fell asleep the whole day. After that, nothing strange has happened. No scratching, no missing items, no loud bangings on the door, no crying. Whatever the entity was, I don't think it wanted to hurt me because once it found out that I was angry, it stopped. Everything has been normal ever since. I have a twin brother, and we both remember a guy called Uncle Jojo. He was an old guy, and I can picture him so clearly in my mind. And when my brother and I describe him to one another, we remember him exactly the same. We also both remember that he was missing his right index finger and that half of his middle finger was gone. We have very vivid memories of him taking us to the lake and buying us food. He taught us how to make a tire swing, which is still there by the lake, and we remember helping him put it up. But none of our other family members have any idea who we're talking about. Our parents and older siblings have no memory at all of Uncle Jojo. But they told my twin and I that as little kids, we used to inexplicably disappear. A lot. All the doors would be locked, yet we'd somehow get out of the house. They never could find us until we suddenly came wandering back hours later. They would even call the police when they couldn't find us. Then we'd just appear out of nowhere, knocking on the door, wanting to be let back in. Even if they had just been outside looking for us and we weren't there, once they were back in the house with the door closed, we'd suddenly appear on the other side, knocking. This all happened between the ages of four and eight. After that, we never saw him again. When we look at photos of family events that we know he was there for, he's not in any of them. And he should be in those photos right between us. We have one where there's a weird gap right between where my brother and I are standing. There are too many weird things that make me think that maybe Uncle Jojo wasn't human. 
Some people theorize that he was a random guy from the neighborhood that no one remembers. But that doesn't explain how our parents could never find us when we disappeared from a locked house. Or how we got out of the house in the first place. How did we, at the age of four, manage to escape from a second-story bedroom of a locked house? Also, Uncle Jojo showed up to family events, but only we saw him, even back then. He always showed up on foot, too, never in a car, no matter how far outside of the city we were. During that time, our parents were fighting a lot, and our older brother had severe behavioral problems, so there was a lot of chaos in the house. My twin and I were considered the good kids of the family, so we were mostly left to our own devices. We spent a lot of time alone in that upstairs bedroom. Uncle Jojo was a really calming influence on us, though. He made us feel safe. But if we mentioned him to our parents, they brushed it off like we were making it all up. But he was real. My brother and I are now 14 years old, but we still remember Uncle Jojo very well. At the age of nine, our mom had us each write down a description of him, and they were almost identical. But the description didn't match anybody that our family knew. The last time we ever saw him was in December of 2014. He took us to the lake, and when we came back, my brother and I got really sick and almost had to be hospitalized. Mom said again we just randomly reappeared, soaking wet and knocking on the door to be let in. But she didn't question it because she was so happy just to have us back home. We also asked our parents and neighbors about the tire swing down by the lake. Nobody knows who put it up. They all say it just appeared there one day. And it's a really good quality swing, too. The person who put it up had to have known what they were doing. And my brother and I both remember helping Uncle Jojo put it up. We were like six years old, though, so we couldn't have helped him too much. But we clearly remember helping him. We both really miss him a lot. The other day, my brother was looking out the window and he said, Do you think if we jumped out and walked down to the lake, Uncle Jojo would be there? I don't think we've ever really moved on. We keep hoping he'll show up again. I'm a nurse, and once we had a little boy, a toddler, come into our hospital by ambulance. After a few days, his condition became life-threatening, so we called his parents in the middle of the night. Before his parents arrived, the boy kept talking about his baby sister Hannah. Soon after that, he died. Fast forward to two years ago. This same family came into the hospital with their sick infant daughter. They remembered me, and I remembered them. Their baby daughter's name was Hannah. Well, that startled me, because I recalled with clarity the little boy speaking about his baby sister Hannah, whom I assumed was alive and living at home two years ago. But no, Hannah hadn't even been conceived yet when her big brother was talking about her right before his own death. Thankfully, Hannah got better, went home with her parents, and is doing well today. But I'll never forget that little boy and his baby sister Hannah whom he knew about on the other side, even before she entered this world. I used to be skeptical of all things paranormal, until this happened. Now I believe, but I wish I didn't. It would be a lot easier to sleep at night. Even now, years later, I wake up at night, plagued by the memory of the screaming man, the child in pain, and the dark ghostly images that turned my world upside down and changed my belief system forever. It was May 2001. I desperately needed to find a place for myself and my three children to live. The lease was up in our small apartment, and I was a single father who was about to be homeless. One evening, I received a call from a woman telling me that there was a house for rent. It was a large old house that was in very good shape. She invited me to come take a look at it. 
You can't imagine the surprise when my daughter and I rolled up on this large old white house. We walked in, and it was perfect. The house had two floors with three bedrooms, a large kitchen, and a huge backyard. And the basement had an old butcher shower and a fruit cellar. It was far more house than we ever thought we could get for the price, and we decided we absolutely had to have it. We spoke to the landlady and she gave me an application to fill out. There were a lot of other people looking at the house, so I knew I would have to compete to become the tenant. I handed in my application and the landlady said, You do realize that there's a lot of responsibility that comes with living in a house this old, right? I said, Oh yeah, I understand, but I didn't really understand what I was agreeing to. Well then, I'll get back to you, she said. She was a strange old lady, and the way she showed the house was not typical. It was more like she was a tour guide at a museum. A week went by, and the phone rang. It was that strange landlady calling to tell me that she had selected my daughter, two sons, and me to live in the house. So that weekend, we moved in. I was removing the last few items from the moving truck when a car slowed down almost to a stop in front of our house. The passenger leaned out from the slow-moving car and said, I hope you'll be okay in there, then sped off. I figured it was just a friendly neighbor. The first night in the house was uneventful. Maybe we were just too tired to notice anything. Or maybe the house wanted to draw us in a little closer before beginning its series of attacks and assaults on us. I did notice something very strange, though. All of the interior doors in the house had an old-fashioned hook and eye latch lock, but not on the insides of the rooms, on the outside, as if they were trying to lock something or someone inside of the rooms. The first incident happened when I was in the living room, hanging a picture of two angels. I hung it up and turned to walk away, and I heard a crash. I turned to see that the picture had fallen to the floor. Rehanging the picture once again, I turned away and again heard a crash. The picture had again fallen to the floor. Hanging it for a third time, I started walking away and I felt a rush of air and something hit the back of my ankle. I turned to see the picture lying at my feet. More determined than ever, I hung the picture yet again and said out loud, now stay there. And I had to laugh because I was alone. The kids were out on the porch, so who did I think I was talking to? Dad, come see this, my daughter called from the front door. I stepped out onto the porch. Sit down and watch this, she said. My daughter pointed to an old man walking down the street towards our house. But as soon as he reached our property line, he quickly crossed the street and continued on the other side. No one wants to walk in front of our house, Dad. Isn't that weird? My daughter was right. I sat on that porch for a good three hours watching our neighbors cross the street every time they came near our house. A couple of times I waved to say hello, but they just avoided eye contact, dropped their heads, crossed the street, and walked even faster. Maybe they were just uncomfortable getting new neighbors, I rationalized trying to make sense from a completely senseless situation. But soon enough, we went in for dinner and just forgot about the whole thing. That weekend, we were doing chores in the yard. I asked my younger son to go inside and bring me the garden hose from the basement so we could clean off the sidewalks. A few moments passed, and I heard him screaming from inside the house. Running inside, I found him standing in the kitchen, shaking. He looked at me terrified and said, Dad, something chased me from the basement. I don't know what it was, but it was big. I told him to calm down and went to check the basement, but I found nothing. Naturally, there was some teasing from his brother and sister about his basement monster. But the rest of the day passed without any problems. We were really happy in that house for the first few days. Unfortunately... That didn't last for long. Monday came. It was the last week of school for my kids, 
but a really long work week for me. Every day I'd leave for work and I'd come home in the evening to find every single light in the house was turned on. I put the blame on the children, thinking they were leaving the lights on every morning. However, on Friday, my daughter and I sent my boys to the car while we went through the entire house making sure all the lights were off. But come that night, we came home again to find every single light burning. When I walked into the house, I was a little shaken. There was no logical reason for the lights to be on unless someone had been in our house. I searched the entire place in a panic, but I found nothing. Daddy, it's really cold in here, my daughter called from the living room. What was she talking about? It was hot outside. I was sweating. However, when I stepped into the living room, the temperature dropped a good 30 degrees. That was the first time I felt its presence. It felt like an electrical current running through my body, bringing tears to my eyes and chill bumps to my arms. It passed quickly, and I remember thinking, what the hell was that? As soon as it passed, the room began to warm up again. I got very little sleep that night. On Sunday night, we were all in the living room talking. I was getting ready to leave the next day on a work trip, and we were discussing the kids staying with my mother for the week. They had their backs turned and didn't see it. Only I saw it. There was something standing in the kitchen doorway. I looked again. No, not something. Someone. It was a dark figure of a man. He was solid, but made up of a churning black smoke. He stood there for what seemed like an eternity, then just melted away, disappearing into the air, gone. I figured we had two choices. One, we could run screaming into the night, like those crazy people you see in the movies. Or two, we could get up quietly, leave the house, and figure this all out later. My hands were shaking as I said as calmly as I could, Let's go get a soda and then go see Grandma. My younger son was excited at the prospect of a soda before bedtime, but my older two looked at me as if I had lost my mind. Come on, guys, it'll be fun, I said. I grabbed the car keys and we headed out. As I was locking the front door, we heard a loud scream of a man coming from inside the house. It sounded like he was in pain. It was so loud it could be heard throughout the entire neighborhood, and all the dogs started barking. At a dead run, we headed for the car and I drove to my mother's house. It's all still a blur to this day, but I remember being in a total panic and just trying to get us away from that house. As we pulled the car out of the driveway, my younger son said, Daddy, the basement monster, he's standing in the upstairs window. I looked back and, sure enough, the black form was standing at the window, watching us leave. That night we stayed with my parents. Early the next day I left for my business trip. I had an entire week away to rationalize what happened. Where else would we go? I put all the money I had and then some into moving to that house. We had no other choice but to go back. Besides, I half convinced myself that it didn't really happen, so I picked the kids up from my parents and we went back to the house. That weekend, we explored the big shed at the far end of the property, and we found a number of personal belongings there. My parents told me that it wouldn't be a bad idea to call that landlady and ask her some pointed questions, and maybe find out what was going on in that house. Well, that turned out to be one of the most awkward and strangest phone calls I've ever made in my life. Choosing my words very carefully, I asked her if any of the previous tenants had ever mentioned seeing a ghost. She said she couldn't remember. Now, how can you not remember a thing like that? If someone told me they saw a ghost in my house, I'd remember it, wouldn't you? She did, however, say that there was one female tenant who claimed that her dead father came to visit her, but the old woman said she was crazy. She claimed a lot of the things in that shed belonged to that woman, but
but she refused to come back and pick them up. The rest of the items in the shed belonged to a man who lived there right before us. But according to the old woman, he left in the middle of the night and left many of his possessions behind. But the landlady claimed that she had never heard anyone talk about the house being haunted. So the phone call wasn't of much help to me at all. And it did nothing to calm my fears. But the rest of the weekend came and went and nothing much happened. I actually convinced myself that this was just a one-time ordeal and nothing more would happen. That is, until Monday night rolled around. I was on the phone with my mother, and the kids were playing in the bedroom. While on the phone, I began to hear the inside doors rattling. I yelled at the kids to quit playing games, telling them I was on the phone and it was distracting me. Then, the doors rattled again this time harder and louder. So I scolded the kids again. But before I could finish my sentence, my daughter cut me off. Daddy, I'm in the living room reading, and the boys are asleep. Now I'll try to tell you what happened next, to the best of my memory. Some of it I remember clearly, but other parts are a blur to this day. But as soon as I heard my daughter's voice, the temperature in the house instantly dropped at least 30 degrees. With it came that feeling of the electrical charge running through my body again. Then a horrible stench that I can only describe as smelling of death permeated the room. And the screaming started. Softly at first, then it grew louder and more forceful. I shouted into the phone for my mother to come and help us. We needed to get out of there fast. Then the whole house began to shake and come alive. From above, I could hear something large coming down the stairs. Boom, boom, boom. Then the screaming of a man over and over. My daughter said, Daddy, what's happening? Whatever it was, was coming down those stairs. I had to get to my children. The whole house was alive with noise. The floor beneath me was shaking as I made my way to the bedroom door to get my boys. I felt something was behind me, but I knew I didn't want to turn around to see what it was. Then a new voice mixed in with a man screaming. This time, a child. I made it to the bedroom door, but it wouldn't open. The man and child were screaming so loudly it was rattling the walls. By this time, I was screaming too. I threw myself against the door again and again, but it just wouldn't budge. I kept slamming myself against it until it finally flew open. I told my older son to grab his brother and run to the car. My daughter was in shock at that point and couldn't move, so I grabbed her and headed for the front door as I heard the other bedroom door slam open behind us. This thing was on our tail, and I knew I couldn't let it get us. We ran out to the porch, and I slammed the door behind us. As we got in the car, we could still hear the noise coming from the house. I drove away and parked on the street where we could still see the house and waited for my parents to arrive. We could see that dark figure searching throughout the house. It moved methodically from room to room, trying to find us. That was our last night in the house. My children never returned, and when I returned to pack our things, I never went back inside alone. Every single person I brought with me to the house all witnessed something paranormal. Whispers, screams, pounding on the floor above. Everybody heard it. I remember what that old landlady said when I handed her the keys. Standing there, the whole side of my arm and torso still black and blue from throwing myself against the bedroom door, she said, Some people are meant to live in an old house like that, and some people aren't. I never thought you were the old house type. Then why did she choose us in the first place? About a month after moving out of the house, a friend called me and said she found something online about the land it was built on. Look up John T. Crow of Union, Missouri, she said. When I did, the face of a man came on my screen. It was the same face that showed up in a picture that my brother took in the fruit cellar the day he was helping me move. The man is famous, 
the land itself is famous. The history of the house dates back to the Civil War. The place is known as the Screaming House. It was built on land owned by Captain Crow, who was a captain in the Missouri militia in the Civil War. He lived there with his wife Minerva until her untimely death. It stands on the spot that once held the slave quarters. In none of the historical documents will you ever find anywhere that the captain admitted to owning slaves. They were always listed as belonging to his wife Minerva, who came from Kentucky. There is talk that Minerva had improper relations with the male slaves, which may have led to her death and the deaths of every young male slave on the property. I guess that explains the locks on the outside of the doors. In 1974, a woman living directly across the street from the Screaming House took an axe and killed her husband. Then, she committed suicide with a gun. In another home across from there, a man committed suicide in front of his young nephew. So there's plenty of reason for that house to be haunted. It seems like the land around it is just plain bad. If you talk to the people who live in the town now, they'll tell you they get physically ill when they get near that house. Others claim it's not just the house, but the entire neighborhood that's haunted. About a year ago, someone I know saw a police car racing there one night, and he witnessed the family running out the front door with their night clothes on. As for what's become of the house today, the old lady turned it into a dog kennel. I guess she ran out of people who would live there. Sometimes I drive past the house, and if I have the nerve, I look in the upstairs window. And there it is. Watching. Waiting. Angry. Sometimes the memory of the screaming still wakes me from my sleep, creeping into my dreams, turning them into nightmares. In my dreams, I see a faceless man standing in the basement, his body covered in blood, washing himself while breathing loudly. It's the very same breathing you'd hear when you were alone with it in a room. Heavy, labored breathing. Yes, I do believe in the paranormal now. And maybe you should too. The apartment that we moved into when I was a teen is haunted. I never believed in ghosts before this. When I was 16, I woke up one night to the sound of children laughing and running around in front of my bedroom door. I was confused because it was just my mom, little brother, and me living there, and my brother hadn't brought any friends over to spend the night. But I thought it must be him and some friends. Where else would kids come from in the middle of the night? So I got up out of bed and went to quiet them down, but I found my brother alone in his room, fast asleep. Once I was back in bed, I heard the children sound starting up again, followed by a high-pitched scream of a child right outside my door. After that, I heard running water in the bathroom. It sounded like a bath was being drawn. I looked to see if the tub was running, but it wasn't. In fact, the tub was bone dry. I looked away and eerily... I could still hear the sounds of the water flowing. Turning back, I looked again in the tub, and I briefly saw what looked like someone floating face down, as if they had drowned. Then suddenly, the tub returned to normal. Nobody was in it, no water sounds, and nothing out of the ordinary. Although I was frightened, I went back to bed again, and within moments of getting back into bed, I heard the sound of children playing outside my bedroom door again. Determined to ignore it this time, I did nothing. It was then that I heard a horrible voice screaming, Get down here! My immediate thought was the voice was talking to the little girls who were playing outside my bedroom door. As I sat up in bed, I heard a loud gunshot, a girl scream, and then another gunshot. For several long moments it was quiet. Then I heard the sound of a door slamming, followed by yet another gunshot. By this time I was starting to think I had gone crazy. 
That is, until I heard my little brother screaming. Rushing to him, I asked him what the problem was, and he said that he heard gunshots too. Well, now I was frightened and curious. So the next day, I began to search the internet to see if anything had happened in our apartment before we moved in, and I found out that an old man had lived there. He was very abusive to his grandchildren. He had two granddaughters and a grandson. He ended up killing all three of them, and himself. He murdered his grandson by drowning him in the bathtub, and he killed his two granddaughters, then himself, with a shotgun. I've since learned to communicate with the spirits of these children, and I asked them why they haven't been able to move on, and they said that their grandfather's spirit won't let them. To make matters even worse, my little brother has been haunted in his dreams by an evil spirit. It abuses him in his sleep. I think it's the spirit of that horrible man continuing to torture children from the afterlife. This story is about my grandparents' house and the evil that haunted them. My parents divorced when I was four and my brother was still a baby. My mother, brother, and I moved in with my grandparents and we didn't see dad for a while. He did call a lot though. My grandparents had been living in their house for about 20 years at that point. When they first bought the property, there was an old dilapidated house standing on it, so they tore it down and built a new one. My grandparents had a pretty tough time after moving into that house. They lost their oldest son, Terry, in a car accident. And not many years after that, another son, Scott, died in a very strange house fire. A lock that would never stay closed before suddenly became stuck, preventing him from escaping. He didn't die right away, though. It took him three days before he finally succumbed to his injuries. This all happened long before I was born but my grandma talked about it all the time. The loss of her sons left a very obvious scar on her heart. She became very paranoid about the house, convinced if my brother and I went in the backyard alone, we would drown in the pool. The first time I ever saw a ghost was in that house. I was sitting at the dining room table with my mother and grandmother, and I looked out the window at the porch. I clearly saw somebody walking along the porch headed for the door, but no one ever knocked. It was daylight, so I got a really good look at the guy. He had dark brown hair, tall, tan, and wore a dark colored jacket. I looked over at the adults for validation, and I found that my grandmother was intently staring out the window. She looked me in the eye, acknowledging that yes, she too had seen it. That was your Uncle Scott coming to visit on his lunch break, Grandma said with a sad smile. At four years old, I wondered for a long time why he didn't just come inside. It took me a while to fully understand and come to terms with the fact that Scott was dead. But then, when I finally figured it out, I would sit there every day waiting for him. Between noon and 1 p.m. every day, he'd waltz past the window, across the front porch, and I'd open the door trying to catch just a glimpse of him. But I never got to see him in full. Thinking about it now, I imagine it was just some sort of remnant of his image. Maybe Grandma's memory was the only thing that kept him walking past that window every day. It brought her some measure of comfort to see him, even if it was only a glimpse. I remember always feeling uncomfortable in that house and not being able to sleep at night, terrified of the dark. Even as an adult, when I think back about trying to sleep in that house, it nauseates me. I would scream bloody murder every time they tried to get me to go to sleep in the bedroom that I shared with my mother. It was a very haunted room. Sometimes they'd relent and I'd sleep with my grandmother, but I'd still hear my grandfather talking to someone in the hallway at night. I kept hearing him tell whoever it was to leave him alone and go away. He would be mumbling something that sounded like a prayer, or he'd curse at whatever it was that was taunting him. I remember being so very frightened every time I would hear it. I tried to wake up my grandmother, but she was a sound sleeper. 
Eventually, I would go out and check on my grandfather on my own, only to find him asleep in the chair with a Bible in his lap. My grandfather was over six feet tall, part Native American Navajo. He was obsessed with the paranormal, Bigfoot, and aliens. My grandmother was 10 years older than him and only four foot 11 with a wicked sense of humor. They always made me laugh and their love was a beautiful thing and they taught me a lot about life. They had been through so much, so for something to scare them, well, that was a big deal. Even though I felt very loved in their home, I did not feel safe there. My mother had a lot of issues, depression, bipolar disorder, and a very bad drinking problem. She had a tendency for disappearing for days at a time and was often in and out of hospitals for her mental health because she refused to take her medication. It was tough on my grandparents, but they helped me out as much as they could. I would just sit and talk to them for hours. Sometimes they'd tell me about their own paranormal experiences, especially my grandfather. Mom would get angry at them for scaring me, but their stories always made me feel less alone and made us closer, so I'm grateful to them for that. A lot of my early ghostly experiences are just fragments of memory. I remember calling my dad late at night, begging him to come get me because I was scared, or riding my bike past the house and seeing a horned demon looking out the window at me. My toys moved around all on their own, and I'd find them broken, essentially mutilated. I'd also find dead animals around the house, and my grandparents' dog would viciously bark and growl at nothing. And there were many shadows and voices throughout the house. One day, my mom and grandma got back from shopping at Walmart, and mom walked into our shared bedroom with all her bags. She placed them on the floor in front of her and was fussing at me for something that I'd done. I remember being very stressed out over the exchange, and suddenly, all of the bags started moving on their own, and stuff started falling out all over the place as if someone were aggressively digging through them and throwing things around. This went on for about 10 seconds before my mom yelled, Stop it! And then, it was done. That was when I realized that ghosts could touch things in the real world, and if that was the case, then they could touch you, and maybe even hurt you. I stopped looking for Uncle Scott after that, and I became even more afraid of the dark. I hated sleeping in my mom's room, and I was never given any more than a nightlight to stave off the pitch blackness. Luckily for me, around that same time, my Uncle Terry, another one, born after the first Terry died and named after him, moved back to my grandparents' home with his boyfriend, James. They took over the basement and decorated it very nicely. There was a wet bar with sodas in it for me. They took the room at the back of the basement, halfway down the hall. If you walked the rest of the way down, there was a small bathroom with a shower, and through that bathroom was a large storage room filled floor to ceiling with stuff that my grandparents had collected through the years. My mother, brother, and I ended up moving down to the basement to a side area that they sectioned off with room dividers. We all three shared a bed facing the wet bar. One night I woke up out of a sound sleep, freezing cold. In the darkness, I could see someone behind the bar. They were clearly moving things around, but I could hear no sound. I watched in silence for a while, trying to discern who it was. At first I thought it was my uncle's boyfriend because they were about the same height. I tried shaking mom awake, but to no avail. So I sat up in bed, trying to lean in closer to see. And the moment I did, the figure stopped moving and slowly turned towards me. I could make out two little white specks that were its eyes. I was frozen in place as we stared at each other, and I remember thinking it was going to kill me. After a few seconds, it uttered in a deep, gravelly, inhuman voice, Go to sleep. Well, despite that order, I didn't sleep for the rest of the night. I hid under my blanket and shook in fear until it was morning and my mom went upstairs. And after that, I refused to sleep down there. Mom said I was being impossible. 
But shortly after this, we began seeing my dad more, and he eventually gained full custody of my brother and me. The story doesn't stop here, though, because my brother had his own experiences to tell. He's three years younger than me, so obviously he didn't retain as much as me, but a couple of things did stick out to him. First, he was seeing grotesque zombie faces in the mirror in that bathroom in the basement. I later found out from my mother that she and her brother Scott had seen the exact same faces when they were playing Ouija board as teens. The other thing he remembers ironically happened in the pool, the place that my grandmother was so afraid of. My brother insists that I try to drown him in the pool. He said that we were playing in the pool and our mom ran inside for something and I pushed him under the water and stood on his neck. He says it was one of the most traumatic events of his childhood, and he's had nightmares about it for years. But I have absolutely no memory of this happening. The only one who does is my brother. I'll admit, I didn't believe him for a long time, but he's stuck to that same story for many years, so I'm convinced that it actually happened, but I can't understand it at all. I have a lot of trouble wrapping my mind around that one, to be honest. The final thing about this house is one that I don't even like mentioning, but I will. When my grandparents got older and couldn't live there anymore, they moved out and my Uncle Bill, his second wife, and his son David moved into the house. Everything was fine for a while, but David always knew that the house was haunted. He really wanted to move back in with his biological mother because he hated being there. His bedroom was in the basement. One day... David went missing. It would be nearly three days before my uncle found him in the basement shower stall, dead. He had somehow, among all the floor-to-ceiling junk, managed to find my grandfather's old shotgun in the storage room. Most of the family didn't even know there was a gun in there, and those who did insisted that it was so old it wouldn't even fire. But somehow David found it, and he did the unthinkable. My uncle still lives in that house to this day, and he's become a very bitter and cruel man. That beautiful on the outside yet deeply disturbing on the inside house, although terrifying and traumatizing, opened my mind up to so much. The years I spent there with my grandparents made me who I am today. I do have memories of them that I hold very close to my heart. My grandparents have both been gone for over a decade now, and I've grown up to be very much like my grandfather, haunted by things that I've experienced, but I still hunger for the truth, like him. Also like him, I'm in tune to nature and things that linger just outside the reach of the human senses. For that reason, I felt that sharing these memories with you would be really important, even if in the end, the only one that's helped is me. Eight years ago, when my wife was pregnant, we needed somewhere to bring up our first child. We chose a small town in northern England because the rent there was affordable. When we first moved in, everything was fine. We were very excited about starting our new family, and we happily went about decorating our new home. You could only access the upper level of the home by using a staircase that was located in the kitchen. Also in the kitchen was a doorway to the backyard, and it had a frosted glass window. Within a few weeks of moving there, I developed a very weird feeling, like someone was watching me through that window. It wasn't overpowering, but it did get to the point where I would actively avoid looking at that window, because part of me worried that I might actually see something looking back at me. I've always been deeply skeptical about anything paranormal, so I always tried to ignore the feeling or just laugh it off. But the feeling kept getting stronger. It got to the point that if I was ever alone in the house, I would choose to sleep on the couch because I didn't want to walk through that kitchen and up the stairs to the bedroom. Whatever was in the house, the feeling was definitely the strongest in the kitchen and on the stairs. The only way I can really describe it is that it felt predatory. There was this constant nagging feeling that something was either watching you 
or standing right over your shoulder about to rush you, even though there was nothing there. Things seriously began to escalate on one particular evening. We were watching the Darren Brown TV show, and he was trying to disprove all things paranormal. At one point in the show, he challenged the viewing audience to play Ouija board along with him. The premise was that he would both ask and guide the responses, and tell you what the results would be, thereby proving that it was nothing more than a parlor trick. My skeptical nature, along with my wife's belief in the paranormal, meant I was really keen to play along, just to prove to her how silly her beliefs were. So we put together a makeshift Ouija board and followed all of the instructions, but we didn't get the results that the show said we would. We got something far more sinister. When we asked the name of our spirit, instead of the scripted reply that we were supposed to get, we got the name Ernest. By this point, I was laughing, thinking that my wife was pranking me. But my wife wasn't laughing. She said we should stop. Still thinking it was her doing, I kept going. I asked, Do you like living here with us, Ernest? It moved to no. Why not, Ernest? Don't you like me? It spelled out the word rogue. Now it's worth a mention that I was confused by that. My only experience with the word rogue was in a video game. I continued. Okay, what do you think of my wife? It spelled out the word whore. By this time, my wife was getting more and more upset, and she was really quite distressed. We followed the rules and said goodbye, and then the glass we were using as the planchette slid over to goodbye, all on its own. Since my wife was so freaked out, I collected the scraps of paper that we used to make the Ouija board and took them into the backyard to burn them, partly for her peace of mind and partly for my own. That night, 30 minutes or so after we went to bed, we heard a loud bang downstairs. I went to check it out, thinking that something may have fallen over, but everything was still in place. Since we lived in a terraced home, I told myself it was probably just the neighbors banging their cupboard door, so I went back to bed. The next night, again within 30 minutes of going to bed, we heard the exact same bang from downstairs. This started happening every single night. No matter what time we went to bed, whether it was 9 p.m. or 1 a.m., within half an hour, we'd hear a bang. Always at least once, sometimes twice. We tried to replicate the sound, and after trying everything, we discovered that it was a heavy cupboard door in the corner of the kitchen. When slammed shut, it made that exact same sound. I wanted to find out what was causing the door to bang shut. We'd never had any signs of pests or vermin, and the cupboard was fixed to the wall about six feet off the floor. I couldn't imagine what was making that door slam shut. So I asked my wife to let me set up a camera in the kitchen to record whatever happened in the night when we were sleeping. But she wouldn't let me do it. She either didn't want to know what it was, or she didn't want to antagonize it. Things really began going downhill from there. We would find ourselves arguing over the smallest thing, having full-blown shouting matches for hours over nothing. I'm normally a very laid-back person, but I found myself constantly on edge, anxious and angry. This didn't happen overnight, though. It was something that built up very slowly with both of us. We didn't even realize it was happening until much later. So this was not a case of waking up a different person from one moment to the next, but a very slow, gradual change over time. I began suffering from nightmares on a regular basis. I would have very vivid dreams of family members dying in horrific ways, like being burned alive. I'd wake up screaming, and my wife would have to reassure me that it wasn't real. Also disturbing, she'd wake up in the middle of the night and find me lying there, eyes wide open, yet sound asleep. 
She'd gently tell me to close my eyes, and I would, but I'd have no memory of it the next day. I've never done that before nor since living in that place. The arguments between my wife and I got worse, and the regular banging noises at night continued. There was also an overwhelming sense that something was following me. That feeling was strongest in the stairwell. Despite my best efforts to convince myself that I was being ridiculous and trying to force myself to walk slowly up the stairs, I found myself clearing that flight of stairs three steps at a time, terrified. My wife told me she felt it too. There was a brief lull in the activity for about a month or so leading up to the birth of our child. It was around Christmas. The arguing stopped and we seemed to be getting back to normal for a while. I thought we'd turned a corner. The nightly banging persisted, but we had gotten so used to it that we would just look at each other and roll our eyes. Then our son was born, and everything was okay for the first week or so, but the atmosphere soon began to change. The unexplained anger and anxiousness began to creep back in, and we started to fight again. Things were made even worse because our baby would cry constantly when he was in the house. He'd only sleep for 20 minutes at a time, and when he was awake, we'd spend all of our time trying to soothe him, but nothing worked. He cried so much that we took him back and forth to doctors many times, but by the time we got away from the house and to the doctor's office, he was either sleeping or gurgling happily. The doctors would look at us like we were crazy, and I also thought we might be cracking up as well because once we got him back home, he'd start crying again. Things came to a head one night when I was in bed. I saw a shadow person in the corner of the room by the window, and it began slowly moving across the room. At first I thought it was a trick of car headlights on the curtains, but the shadow wasn't moving right. The room was dark, but this thing was darker than the room, and it seemed to have smoke coming off of it. It inched its way across the standing wardrobe, and then it went around the corner and continued along the wall. At that point, I knew it wasn't a shadow. A shadow would have jumped from the wardrobe to the wall, not creep around the corner. I watched as it went out the door and onto the stairs. If this were to happen now, I'd have noped it straight out of that room. But at the time, I remember being oddly mesmerized by it. I only started to feel fear after it left the room, and I had time to think about it. I decided not to tell my wife about it. We already had enough to deal with. Telling her that I just saw a manifestation could very well have pushed her right over the edge. It was winter at that point, and the house was always cold. No matter how hard we tried, we couldn't get that place to maintain a constant room temperature. One room would be red hot, and the one next to it, freezing cold, despite the heat being set to the same temperature throughout the house. And there was no rhyme or reason to it either. Rooms that experienced hot or cold varied from hour to hour. The temperature would spike in one room, only to plummet to an unnatural cold temperature within the space of 30 minutes. We had to constantly move the baby from room to room to find a comfortable place for him. Unfortunately, I found that the one place in the house with a constant temperature was the staircase landing. So I'd find myself having to sit there, fighting my fear and desire to run away because it was the one place where our child could be comfortable. It was around this time I had a dream that I still remember very clearly. In the dream I was talking to a woman, telling her how dark and cold the house was. She asked me if I knew what that meant. Then she told me that life needs light to grow, and the only thing that thrives in the darkness is death. I woke up with those words still on my mind. Now, often when you hear stories about people staying in a haunted house, they tell you they're fighting for their house and what's theirs. But this wasn't our house. We were renting, and all the problems and the weirdness got to be too much. We found a house a few miles away and gave our notice. The night before we moved, in the early morning hours, we heard a piercing noise. 
It was the carbon monoxide alarm going off. We opened all the doors and windows and went outside. My wife and son went to my parents while I waited for the man from the gas company. When he arrived, he found that the problem was the gas fireplace leaking carbon monoxide. Without that alarm, we'd have all been dead. The fact that it happened the night before we were due to leave made me think that something either didn't want us to go or was taking a parting shot. I'd like to tell you that we moved and everything was better overnight, but it wasn't. The new house started out okay, but then that nagging feeling about being followed slowly crept back in. Not as intense, but noticeable. When we first moved in, we all shared a bedroom, because there was a lot of unpacked boxes and stuff cluttering up the spare room. One of the things in the spare room was a bouncer for the baby. This was a Fisher-Price bouncer that had a frog on it, and if you rolled the frog's eyes, it would play music. One day around four in the morning, the frog started playing music. I looked over at the crib, thinking that my now toddler might have somehow gotten out and was playing with it, but he was fast asleep. The next day, I wanted to figure out how it could have gone off by itself. I tried to get that thing to play again without spinning the eyes. I knocked it around and stomped on the floor next to it, but nothing happened. So I told myself the batteries must be malfunctioning, but this was the one and only time it ever happened, and we never had to change the batteries in the two years that we used it. I began to feel that something was watching me again, only now it was strongest in the conservatory out back. There was a set of double doors between the kitchen and the conservatory, and one night, my wife asked me to close them. I didn't ask her why, I just did it. A little while later, I went out back to have a cigarette. As I stepped outside, the glass doors of the conservatory were in front of me. All I could see in the reflection was the kitchen behind me. But then I saw in the reflection a black silhouette of a person running, and it ran into the house through the wall. At first I thought it was somebody outside, but then I realized that it couldn't have been anyone outside, as the figure was briefly obscured by my own reflection, so it had to have been somebody in the room behind me. I quickly went back into the house. At first I wasn't going to tell my wife and scare her, but I decided to tell her about it the next day. She then told me that she wanted those doors shut in the first place because that room in the conservatory was making her nervous the day before more so than usual. We had another experience about a month later, which could have ended very badly. While driving down the road getting ready to pull onto the motorway, my wife suddenly hit the brakes. When I asked her what she was doing, she said that a dark shadow figure ran right in front of the car, almost causing her to lose control. But there was no one around at all. That road is located by the woods, far away from any houses. I was in the back seat with our son, so I didn't see it. But my mother-in-law was in the front, and she saw it too. We eventually moved again. But just like in the last place, this house took a parting shot. On the day we moved out, as we were taking our belongings from the house to the van, a heavy roof tile slid down the side of the house, narrowly missing us. This all happened about eight years ago now, but we often still walk past that first house we lived in. It comes up for rent a lot since nobody ever stays there very long. But the funny thing is, every time we see it on the market again, we both have a very strong desire to move back in. We've even talked about going for a fake viewing just so we can walk around the place. We never have, but even the idea that after everything that happened to us there, we still feel an urge to go back? Well, that's something my brain just can't explain. I'm tempted to go back through all the old census records to see if an Ernest ever lived in that house. But so far, I've resisted that temptation. Partly out of fear of setting something off again, and partly because I might not like the answer.
my dad has a very small house. It was built in the 1920s and has two bedrooms, a bathroom, and a living room kitchen, all in just 595 square feet. My brother and I shared a room that was so small that to conserve space, we used bunk beds. I was on the top. That bedroom always scared me, and I had a huge fear of the dark as a kid, and I kind of still do. Back then, we had a dollhouse in the room. It was about five feet tall and stood against the opposite wall from the beds. One night, I had a sense of dread, so I was hiding under the covers. But when the air got too hot, I had to peek my head out to breathe. And when I did, I looked through the bars of the bunk bed and I saw a young boy about my age standing next to the dollhouse. And it wasn't my brother who was fast asleep on the bunk below me. I dove back under those covers with my heart pounding. But after a few minutes of repeating to myself, he's not there, it's just your imagination. I had to check to make sure that I hadn't seen what I thought I saw. But when I finally got the nerve to poke my head back out, the boy was staring at me from just inches away with his face pressed up against the bars of the bunk bed. I can't remember if I screamed or just hid again, but I do know that I called out for my brother, pounding the wall with my hand until he woke up. But he never saw the little boy that night, and I never saw him again after that. There are other stories involving that room right up until the time I moved out last year. Things moved around on their own. Christmas lights would sway in a non-existent breeze, and a woman was standing at the foot of my bed, staring at me. My father saw a child crawling out of our bedroom, wearing only underwear. He yelled to go get dressed, thinking it was one of us. But when he checked, my brother and I were both in our room, fully dressed. And these are just some of the stories that happened there. I'm a 27-year-old female, and I live with my girlfriend. We recently moved to a very nice house in the countryside in Ireland. It's an old wooden house, and we thought it would be a very nice place to live. The first weeks were fine, but sometimes we'd hear footsteps on the stairs. A few months passed, and I started to hear scratching under the bed in the middle of the night. I checked, but there was nothing there. One night as I was sleeping, I heard my girlfriend talking to someone downstairs. I listened closely to try to hear the conversation. She was asking someone what they were doing up so late. I was confused, so I went downstairs to see. I saw my girlfriend talking to someone who looked identical to me. I asked her who she was talking to, and she spun around and had a terrified expression on her face. I, I, I thought it was you. She turned back around to see that the other me had completely disappeared. We didn't sleep that night, and we're moving out next week. I was appointed to guard a sick prisoner at the district headquarters hospital. I liked the duty because it was just eight hours a day, rather than my usual 12-hour tours. Plus, it was nice and calm. I'd just sit there on a bench in his room, reading and having a look at the nurses. Nothing to complain about. Everything was fine, except for the prisoner that I was guarding. He was very old and feeble. I don't know what he was diagnosed with, but he looked like a skeleton with skin. He had a big, bald head, his eyes were popping right out of their sockets, and his mouth was always wide open, and yet he was unresponsive. It was torture to watch him getting shots because he had no muscle left at all, just skin and bones. Although he was unresponsive, oddly, you would never see him asleep. He would just spend all day long staring at the wall with a blank expression. I used to think to myself, He's not really here. He's somewhere in another realm waiting to die. There was something astoundingly creepy about this guy, I'm telling you. Anyway, 
I sat next to him daily from 4 p.m. till midnight. He wouldn't move, he wouldn't talk, and he didn't seem to feel anything. He didn't even look around at all, just a straight, constant gaze at the wall. One night, at the end of my shift, I was tired and bored, counting the minutes until midnight for the guard to come and relieve me so I could go home. There was complete silence in the ward. So to fight the boredom, I picked up a magazine and began to read it for the third time. Barely a few minutes went by and I began to feel uncomfortable. So I looked up and the old man who hadn't moved in God knows how long had turned his head and was staring directly at me. There's no way I can fully explain just how uneasy this made me feel. I was barely three feet away from him, sitting on a bench right next to his bed. He fixed a straight, uninterrupted gaze on me, like he was looking into my soul, not speaking a word. Thank God just moments later my colleague appeared to relieve me. We talked briefly, I handed him my log register and I got out of that hospital as fast as I could and I took a cab ride home. I still lived with my parents at the time. It was around 1 a.m. when the cab dropped me off in my neighborhood. From there I had a 10 minute walk by foot to my home as the streets were far too narrow for vehicles. My home was located at the very end of a dark street. We didn't have public lights on the road and no one but my parents would leave their outside lights on, and they only did it when I was coming home late from work. So, turning onto my street, I was engulfed in darkness, save for a single glowing light bulb at my parents' house at the very end of the road. Suddenly, I saw somebody right in the middle of the street walking towards me. I slowed down a bit to observe. He was about 40 yards ahead, walking very slowly, leaning heavily to the right, and shuffling along with the strange halting gait. I have never encountered anyone on the street that late at night. I went on high alert. Something inside me screamed, You're in danger. Who are you? I called out. I never stopped walking, but I did slow down a bit while approaching him but it was just a matter of seconds before I was close enough to get a clear look at him. And that's when I saw his face. May the Lord have mercy on my soul. It was that same sick old prisoner that I had just left at the hospital an hour earlier. He was wearing the same hospital gown, had the same look on his face, and he was shuffling along with bare feet. He looked at me as I passed him by, and then... He turned around slowly and began walking towards me again. I didn't run, but I did walk super fast to my home. As I got to the front door, I rang the bell furiously, praying to God that my father would open the door fast. I kept pressing the doorbell while staring at this man slowly approaching me. What if he gets me, I wondered. Should I shout or attack him? I didn't want anyone to know how afraid I was of this sick old man. Thankfully, my father opened the door, chiding me for being so impatient. Before going inside, I glanced around, but there was nobody on the street now. My father went back to his room without noticing how scared I was. I went to my room and sat down and thought about what just happened. Did I see a ghost? How is this possible? I sat there thinking of any legitimate reason that could explain this. My room had a window that looked onto the street, and I noticed that somebody was outside my window. I heard those same shuffling footsteps outside, and then a low-pitched voice mumbling mournfully. I sat there, frozen, trying to make out the words, but I couldn't. I couldn't understand what he was saying but he sounded deeply wounded, as if expressing grief. Then it stopped. No sound of any kind. I could feel that nobody was outside my window anymore. And then it struck me. Why don't I just call the hospital? 
I could just ask my colleague how the patient was doing. So I picked up my cell phone, and lo and behold, there was a text message that was sent by my colleague a half hour earlier. It said, Don't come to the hospital for duty tomorrow. The sick prisoner died shortly after you left. I'm going home. Report to the police station tomorrow. No matter how I try to spin this, to convince myself that it wasn't paranormal, I fail. I was a constable in South Australia. One night we received a noise complaint about a party being held in an old derelict building on the outskirts of town. As we approached the building, there was a man standing outside waving us down. From our car, we could clearly hear party music. It was almost deafening, as loud as a concert. This was a very old heritage-listed building, constructed around 1700. All of the windows were boarded up, but you could see what looked like flashing disco lights flooding through the cracks in the boards. The entire property was surrounded by a two-meter-high fence with barbed wire on top. Try as we might, we couldn't find a way in on our own so we had to call the fire department for help. Thirty minutes later, with the fire department and more backup to help us catch possible squatters living in the house, everyone was in position to make entry. We breached the front door, with officers yelling, Police! to announce our presence. As soon as we walked through the door, the house was plunged into darkness and silence. We were all standing there looking around, and there was no one there but us. All 20 members of the police and fire department were just standing there looking at each other, with the most confused looks on our faces. The next night, I found out that that party house was sealed off over 40 years earlier, when another party guest had been killed and the house was deemed unsafe. The cause of death? Unknown. But that house is so old, it never had any electricity, nor was it retrofitted for electricity. Yet on that night, over 20 professional people heard loud music from the 80s and saw disco lights through the cracks in the boards. To this day, my friends and I still don't know what it was all about, but we also don't talk about it much, either. Thank you so much for listening tonight and for being part of my family of darkness. I appreciate every single one of you. Now click or tap on the screen above to hear more stories like this so you can stay scared until we meet again, my friends. <laughs>